Good evening, everybody. I just wanted to say before we start tonight that our speech project is really important. So if you could please, if you're at all interested in sharing some time, maybe 10 minutes a week, contact us at info at everything ALS and we will be right there with you. So thank you. Sarah, it's all yours. Thank you, McFinn. Well, I am very excited to uh, get to introduce our two speakers tonight. They are coming from University of Pennsylvania, which is where my family lives. So I'm very excited to be um, representing the home state. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce Ms. Randy Fishman. She's the founder and key advisor to both the J.S. Fishman ALS Augmentative Communication Program at Boston Children's Hospital, as well as the Home Assisted Ventilation Program at the University of Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. She is co-founded and a member of the advisory board of Answer ALS and a member of the executive committee of ALS Finding a Cure. In these roles, she continues to work that she and her late husband, Jay Fishman, began in support of ALS research and projects and especially patient care programs for the ALS community. Speaking with her tonight, we have Dr. John Hansen Flashen. He is a professor at the, of medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. He served as the Chief of Pulmonology, Allergy, and Critical Care Divisions at the University of Penn. And within this role, he was founded the Paul Heron Lung Center at Penn University. In March 2017, Dr. Hansen Fishman, as well as Ms. Ray Fishman, founded the Jay and Randy Fishman Program for Home Assisted Ventilation within the Paul Heron Lung Center at Penn. This endowed program serves adults who require long-term mechanically assisted ventilation due to chronic nerve or muscle diseases such as ALS and muscular dystrophy. We are so lucky to have them tonight and I can't wait to turn it over to them both. Really appreciate that Sarah um, uh, connects me to the University of Pennsylvania, but let me just say that's by marriage only. I'm not an alum, however, <laughs> My husband was and uh, my, a lot of members of my family are. So I think by association, I've just kind of become there. Uh, saying is my husband was um, originally diagnosed about seven and a half years ago. And uh, being that he had a, a more atypical version of the disease and not being limb onset, it was axial onset, which means that primarily his trunk muscles were involved, uh, abdominal, core muscles, which uh, frequently is a term that's used now instead of trunk muscles. And therefore, because of that, um, from relatively soon from the diagnosis, he had difficulties with breathing um, as opposed to ambulation and uh, upper limb usage. And so um, that really caused us to be obviously concerned about his respiratory function and just his general comfort. And by way of the good fortune of a friend of ours who had done some research for us, um, they found John Hansen Flash in a pen. We are from the New York area, so it's not that far. And as I said, um, my husband um, was an alumna of the university and also served on the board of trustees. So we were well-versed with the university in general. And so we came you know, to have a consultation with John who was, I'm sorry to say, but I'm gonna guess many of you have experienced this, the first pulmonologist who really kind of took this entire breathing situation with a level of seriousness. And not to diminish any other um, institution, but I will mention we had been to three other very fine top tier university medical ALS centers. And, um, John immediately said, oh, I, I get this problem. I'm certainly not you know, an expert in ALS, but I've certainly treated other people with this. And this is what we're going to do and really took a very comprehensive view of the pulmonary situation. And um, we really formed a wonderful partnership. The three of us became very good friends. And he actually kind of brought up this idea that this, whole ALS situation, while it's certainly a neurologic disease, as all of you know, um, yes, all of our muscles start to become affected, but when our breathing muscles become affected, it's really what threatens your life. I mean, you can live quite some time being paralyzed, but when your 
breathing muscles aren't working and or your breathing muscles are affected, it really changes the quality of your life. And we found John to be very open and understanding and very, very helpful in a much more technology-based approach to monitoring breathing and making adjustments and really helping Jay uh, function at his maximum ability. Um, and so with that, I welcome my friend, John Hanson Blaschen, who as Sarah said, we, um, my husband and then I have continued to be associated with in this project to really help, we would say revolutionize in a way, the approach of ALS as a dual uh, discipline um, type of a disease, not just a neurologic disease. And um, I'm sure he's gonna share with you his insights, his approach, and some things we can all look at and perhaps do, and um, just general advocacy for that. So, John, it's all yours. Oh, thank you, Randy, for a <laughs> wonderful introduction. You're so kind to me. Uh, well, uh, you're so thank, kind to me, you know that. <laughs> uh, thank you also to all of you who turned your cameras on, especially those of you with ALS. Uh, you remind me, but I do what I do. Uh, it's very kind of you to let me see your faces. Well, I'm going to start with a question. What's more important than breathing? Well, there's some things that are very important in life, but what is more important than breathing? I, I can't come up with a, a good answer to that. What's worse than losing your breath, being unable to catch it? What's worse than feeling your breath fade away from you? For almost everybody, the natural untreated history of ALS is progressive loss of breathing into respiratory insufficiency, into respiratory failure to air hunger, into death by suffocation. Respiratory failure is the usual expected cause of death in ALS. That's some bad news. The good news is we have wonderful tools available to counter all of that. It was 19, it was 2006 when scientists first showed that assisted ventilation, mechanically assisted ventilation can prolong survival and improve quality of life in ALS. Others have verified that. Our own group did again, just uh, with a publication that came out just a few weeks ago. To this day, mechanically assisted ventilation is the only treatment known to substantially improve survival in ALS. Now we all hope for more soon, but this is the treatment that prolongs survival. Better get it right. Some good news is that the technology supporting mechanically assisted ventilation has exploded uh, since 2006, and particularly in the last five or 10 years. Today, we have an extraordinary array of highly sophisticated tools to help people with weak breathing muscles catch their breath and hold on to it. I've just shown a few of the tools that are available here. Some of these are extraordinary sophisticated. Mechanical ventilators are amongst the most sophisticated, elegant, challenging, uh, mechanical tools that are used in the home today for medical care. Uh, a great deal of expertise is required to assemble these into a coherent uh, treatment pattern and solve problems. And I'll just tell you right now, right now, that pulmonologists and critical care physicians and sleep physicians are not being trained in the use of these devices for home care of people with chronic respiratory insufficiency. It's just flat out not in our training programs. I've shown you a lot of equipment there. I just want to state quickly that I have no financial engagement 
with any of those companies, and that's important because I will be discussing a number of products, uh, mechanical devices as we go along. Well, uh, Randy uh, anticipated this slide. I feel very strongly that uh, yes, ALS is a neurological disease. It's a disease of nerves, but it is also very much a pulmonary disease, a leading cause of respiratory failure and there's no condition more central to my specialty than respiratory failure. ALS is a neurological disease and a pulmonary disease. But here's some more bad news. Altogether, way too few pulmonologists have stepped in to this emerging specialized field of long-term assisted ventilation for people with chronic respiratory insufficiency. There's a terrible dearth of pulmonologists who specialized in this condition. The reasons for that are complex and multiple, but it's the miserable absolute truth. You get a sense of that by looking at the multidisciplinary care model put forward by the ALS Association and other organizations Many of you have seen this already. Notice that the physician in this model is a neurologist, maybe one or more neurologists, uh, working closely together with a number of non-physician specialists sharing a common interest in ALS. In the ALS association model, one of the participants is a respiratory therapist not a pulmonologist. Uh, respiratory therapists are wonderful people. I, I, I work closely with several uh, and depend on them every day. Respiratory therapists qualify for their profession by earning an associate degree or a technical bachelor's degree. By training and by state licensure, respiratory therapists compared to radiology uh, or laboratory technicians, a striking contrast, for example, to physical and occupational therapists, most of whom today have earned a doctorate degree and gone on to postgraduate training that's very similar to what physicians undergo. So in this model, it's the ALS Association model, respiratory failure represented by an associate or bachelor's degree candidate who uh, ordinarily walk, works hand in hand, face to face with pulmonologists. Most respiratory therapists work in hospitals, in ICUs, and that's where their training lies. So I want to get across to you that there's a hole, there's a deficit in the care of ALS. The one treatment that prolongs survival is under supported by my own specialty by pulmonary physicians. There's Jay and Randy Fishman. Uh, they turned things around in mid-Atlantic region of the United States by making it possible for us to launch our program. And uh, we're four years old now, uh, growing rapidly. We serve not only ALS patients, for, but people with other neuromuscular diseases, congenital diseases like muscular dystrophy, spinal muscular atrophy, Severe chronic obstructive pulmonary disease leads to respiratory insufficiency. So a common uh, theme here is home assisted ventilation for a variety of diseases, including ALS. Much of what I'm going to present today, I've learned just in this last three or four years in close collaboration with these people with the incredible support of, of, of the Fishmans. In the next few minutes, I'm going to try to tell you what you most need to know about respiratory manifestations of ALS. Now, I'm imagining here that you, this audience, is people who have ALS, loved ones who participate in the care of people who have ALS, 
And others in a position to guide and advise people who get ALS on how to approach this terrible disease. So I hope that's my audience and that's what we're gonna try and address with a, a short tour of what you most need to know about breathing in ALS. What's well, kind of complicated, talk about respiratory failure, but in fact, the respiratory system is comprised of three vital organs. The lungs, the central airways, and the respiratory pump. The lungs shown here in purple are responsible for gas exchange to draw oxygen out of the air into the blood and the lungs excrete the waste product carbon dioxide from the blood back into the air. The lungs also filter venous blood uh, en route to arteries and back into the body. That's another crucial role. But the lungs would do nothing without the other two parts. The second vital organ of respiration is the central airways, starting at the tip of the nose and mouth, down into the throat, into the trachea and main bronchi that feed air into the lungs during inspiration and out during expiration. Second vital organ of respiration is the central airways. And the third, poorly understood, it's the respiratory pump. The respiratory pump is to respiration, but the heart is to circulation. It moves, in this case, air in and out of the lungs. You don't serve, survive 10 minutes without a functioning heart. You don't survive 10 minutes without a functioning respiratory pump. The main most important muscle of the respiratory pump is the diaphragm. The structures also needs the rib cage to hold the space open for the lungs. And in fact, the sum total of this other vital organ of respiration, diaphragm, chest cage, uh, it's another, is a lot of respiratory accessory muscles shown here. Here's the breastbone and the ribs going across. Here's the diaphragm, which pulls down to draw air into the chest. Other muscles are required as well. Anterior abdominal muscles, muscles between the ribs, muscles of the anterior chest wall, and muscles of the neck all participate either in inspiration or in expiration or both. Some are primary and some are backup secondary muscles. If you see an ALS patient contracting the muscles of the neck with every breath, you know the diaphragm is very weak and these accessory muscles are kicking in to make up for the weakness. ALS is a disease of the nerves that supply these respiratory muscles, the respiratory food. Respiratory insufficiency and failure of ALS is not primarily lung failure, it's respiratory pump failure. I want to go over with you some of the early signals that the respiratory pump might begin to weaken and just start to fail in this ALS. And, and I, please pay attention. Uh, I'm gonna be putting forward here a notion that people with this disease should lean in to their disease, should anticipate and know what's coming and prepare for it and run ahead of each step in the progression of the disease. No drama, no crises. Jay Fishman as an ambassador for ALS uh, drove this message home time and time again. It says, Randy, since him and me now, I lean into the disease, anticipate what's coming, be aware of your body for all kinds of reasons, but as the best possible strategy to 
to prevent uh, losing your breath and not being able to catch it. So these are some of the symptoms, some of the things that a person might feel and experience as respiratory muscles are getting weak. Often the first thing is an interruption, a disruption of sleeping at night. The respiratory pump is most vulnerable during sleeping at night. It uh, naturally, normally <clears throat> gets a little bit weaker. And so this is the first place that ALS often shows up with interrupted or disrupted sleep that may give rise to morning headaches, kind of a sense of brain fog during the day, an unexplained fatigue, and daytime sleepiness. So these are very nonspecific uh, symptoms. People may have them before they have ALS, and there are other reasons a person with ALS might acquire them. But uh, respiratory muscle weakness can cause any and all of these. Of course, respiratory muscle weakness can bring about a shortness of breath with ordinary activity. You used to run upstairs without thinking about it, and now, oh, it's a struggle. You're struggling to get the air you need going up the, the uh, steps. <clears throat> People with diaphragm weakness may not be able to lie flat comfortably in bed. The name for that is orthopnea. And when people have weakness of the expiratory muscles, if they find they have a weak cough, it doesn't clear ordinary secretions from their throat or their lungs as much as it used to. These are all early signal signs of respiratory muscle weakness. I want to particularly emphasize a discomfort in breathing lying flat. That's diaphragm weakness. Some of these others have other explanations. Breathing discomfort lying flat in ALS means time to get serious about anticipating and preparing and leaning in to what's coming with breathing muscles. Well, this, this incredible new era when we have so many new tools uh, enables uh, people who really want to get into this with ALS to add on top of the, an awareness of symptoms, some measurements that just in the last few months could practically be performed at home by patients. And why would you want to do this? Well, remember, uh, you may not have a pulmonologist dedicated to ALS, expert in this disease that you're consulting with from early on, there just might not be the right kind of person in your community. You heard Randy and Jay shopping around to find such a person. So look, if you have one, power to you, and they'll guide you through this. But if not quite, these are some tools that you might want to invest in uh, to augment the, the measurements being made in an ALS clinic or to uh, really climb on top of, of uh progression of respiratory muscle weakness. Uh, if, if, you, if you have this disease or you knew somebody who had it, uh, you know that uh, clinicians measure the vital capacity. You can do this yourself at home now. Several companies are, are manufacturing small handheld spirometers. Uh, this battery operated spirometers that Bluetooth transmit to a cell phone and from there to a doctor's office or wherever. And they're FDA approved for this, they're pretty accurate. So it is possible to track your own vital capacity early on in the course of the disease um, for the cost of one of these devices. There's several available right now this week I'm partial to the medical international research Mir Spiral Bank Smart, shown here. Uh, they also sell another device, Mir Smart One. You don't want that one. That one does not measure the vital capacity, only the FEV1, the measure that's important for asthma and COPD. So if you get into this, look for the Mir Spiral Bank Smart, shown in orange, shown uh, transmitting by Bluetooth a report to a 
cell phone. Uh, uh, you can get this device online from MFI Medical. Go to that website and it says you have to be a clinician, a doctor to order online, but I'll tell you a secret, uh, you don't. <laughs> uh, uh, it's not fully approved for use by patients directly. So, but uh, if you put an order in, I did this two days ago without revealing that I was a doctor and I got one. So, uh, MFI Medical sells this. As soon as next month, some other product might come be available and even be better, but I recognize this one now. And in the report, the one you're looking at is the force vital capacity. Take a sitting, standing position. Every time you do this, same time of day, preferably in the morning when you're strongest. Fill your lungs with air, blow them out, Blow, blow, blow till you can't squeeze any more air out and release. The machine will measure how much air you blew out and report that as an FVC force filing capacity. Now for this purpose, you don't have to force the air out. You can breathe slowly and smoothly and, and evenly a slow violent capacity. What's important is how much air you blew out. The convention is to do three times and record the best of those three measures. Here on the main screen, and uh, here it creates a table with each measurement you make, uh, FEC on the, on the far side. Uh, Medicare uh, guidelines uh, approve a ventilator assist device for a vital capacity less than 50% predicted. And this machine will tell you the percent predicted. Um, and, and so you can track looking for that number. Many of us think that's later than it should be that some people should start assisted ventilation well below before a vital capacity of 50%, especially if they have difficulty breathing lying flat, but, but there you have it. If you're doing this once a week or a couple times a month and then once a week, you'll be confident that you recognize eligibility for a ventilator without delay. Another device to think about getting is a pulse oximeter. Now there are many pulse oximeters available for 30, 40, $50 off Amazon a little clip on the tip of your finger. Uh, we use them, they're, they're okay. Uh, uh, devices like this one have a considerable advantage. They're more accurate and they record. This wristwatch device made by the company known and can be worn overnight. Remember night is the most Vulnerable time in the ALS patient for breathing. Record overnight at Bluetooth to a cell phone or a computer, makes fancy graphs. Uh, so it's a considerable investment there. And if you don't have it, you can get a, one of the less expensive fingertip ones, but uh, for people who are really interested in tracking their disease and being on top of it, uh, this is a device that I can recommend. Medicare approves respiratory assist devices. If overnight, the saturation drops below 88% for more than five minutes. Very roughly here, I've given uh, some guidelines to what the numbers mean. See here, it shows an oxygen saturation of 96%, that's normal, and a heart rate of 74. Very, very roughly, depending on your circumstances, you find out for yourself. A normal is above, is 95 or above. Um, if you start with normal lungs, then an oxygen saturation 89 to 95 means something's wrong. It's no big kind of emergency. An oxygen saturation below 88 qualifies for a ventilator, qualifies for home oxygen. This is not a crisis, a catastrophe, an emergency rush to an emergency room. 
but it tells you something is wrong with your lungs or your respiratory pump. All right, so you, you've been paying attention to your symptoms, you've been tracking your vital capacity at home, and uh, you make the commitment together with the doctor to initiate home and system ventilation. Now, what's this all about? They suggest that this kind of therapy has four primary goals maintain or restore uninterrupt, uninterrupted restorative sleep. Home assisted ventilation starts overnight, most vulnerable time, and should expect to uh, restore a good night's sleep uh, with benefits extending into the day. Uh, when people get short of breath and rest, sitting up awake, whoa, no escape. Well. Home assisted ventilation should and most often can alleviate intermittent or sometimes later on continuous breathing discomfort while at rest. Today, we are able to maintain normal oxygenation and carbon dioxide removal with assisted ventilation. And to me, that's a very important goal and one that we work hard on. Now, I've listed a fourth goal here, which is to protect my airways and lungs. Given full ventilatory support, the pulse people down with ALS is the function of the airways and the lungs from accumulation of secretion pneumonia from atelectasis. So another very important goal of respiratory care for ALS is to protect the airways in the lungs. Bi level devices and ventilators are breathing assisted machines and they address the first three of these goals on my list. It's useful to know the difference and how they're used differently. High level respiratory assist devices evolved out of CPAP machines for sleep apnea. Same lineage. Here are two commonly used ones a Respironic Dream Station and a Respmed Air Curve 10. These give two pressures expiratory pressure and an inspiratory pressure. The inspiratory pressure is a boost to each inspiration. Think about walking up a steep hill. You're very tired. Someone else comes along and places both hands on your cap from behind. Each time you reach a step, that person behind gives constant pressure during your step. You're still walking up the hill, but you're getting an assess with each breath. It helps to make it up the hill comfortably. That's what these machines do. They sit on the side of a bed table, not portable, don't have battery. They do have um, internal humidifiers. These devices are intended to support boost respiration while people sleep at night. The next step up is a full-fledged ventilator. Ventilator doesn't have an internal uh, humidifier, does have a battery, alarms, and a very elaborate set of settings, big screen so that it's easy to see what's going on to monitor the devices. These machines are called for by all means when somebody extends beyond seven, eight hours of assisted ventilation in 24 and extend on into the day. Now for strange reasons having to do with Medicare reimbursement, a lot of people are started on this bypassing the bi-level devices. These do the same thing and more and that's fine. Although I think the federal government will be cracking down on more on that in the future. In any case, 
A ventilator is imperative when someone goes beyond seven, eight hours a day and then wants to have any kind of a life during the daytime. This is a Respironix Trilogy, a horse that's been so commonly used, the ResMed Astro Ventilator. And a new kit on the block, the Voxen, is a ventilator with four other devices, but all in one machine that is attractive in many ways for people with ALS. Now this machine is actually one model obsolete. Respironix has recently introduced the Evo ventilator. Here's the trilogies behind. Here's the Evos, they're smaller. They generally have more capability. The, uh, a trilogy is fine, but if you're starting out and you have an opportunity to get an Evo, do it. The companies that supply these, the durable medical equipment companies are gonna be happy to give you their own machine, um, but they know they have to invest in these new ones. So you know about Evos and you're new to this and you can say, thank you very much. I'd like to have an Evo. Well, machine sitting on, on a bedside table is blowing air. It's a hose, it's a machine and it's a hose and blows air. Uh, to make this a useful device for breathing, you need an interface, a face mask. Today, more than 200 models are available in the United States. 200, this is, so it's like a shoe store. I think mean, few shoe stores have 200 shoes in it. And they come in a variety of configurations. Over here to the left is nasal pillows, very low profile. This is a nasal mask, sits over the nose. This is actually a full face mask because it covers the mouth and it presses gently up against the nose. It's a combination of nasal pillows and a, and a mouth mask. Here's another variant of it. This tube goes down the front, this tube goes off the back, matter of comfort. These are full face masks with a triangular configuration that fit up over the nose with or without a forehead strap. These are more comfortable for some people, but it can interfere with, with vision a little bit. So some, this is a often preferred here and now, gets the thing further away from your eyes. 200 of these, the leading manufacturers for the United States are ResMed, Philips Respironix, Fisher Paykel. We have a lot of research and product development and full lines of masks. Other, others are available for specialty purposes, but uh, these are three companies with intense commitments to getting masks ready. Now you get your ventilator through a durable medical equipment company on a referral from a clinician and they should supply you for a mask. But the honest truth is uh, they have some favorites in the truck. They have, I don't know, two different lines of different sizes. And maybe the first one they give you works just fine, wonderful, terrific. And maybe it doesn't. Well. You can negotiate with them and try and get another mask and another mask like you would in a shoe store where you're trying to get just the right running shoes. But you have the opportunity to climb on top of this yourself if you'd rather do that. A number of online companies now sell ventilators and masks and everything. Uh, out of your own pocket, you can buy a mask, more than one mask. Uh, there are 80 to $150. In the beginning, you send a uh, prescription by a physician to that company for a BiPAP machine or, or a CPAP mask. And then you just order it like you would anything else. You go on those sites and you see complete lines. You can go searching back and forth and, and imagine what one you might like. Get some advice from other people who are doing this or from clinicians. So you can be empowered to get the right mask yourself. Again, I have no per reason to um, prefer a manufacturer or supplier one over another, but I've listed here three companies that are uh, 
well invested in supplying these devices and uh, I've dealt with all three of them and they're honest, reliable companies. Assisted ventilation is kind of half the story. The other part is protecting the airways and lungs. I don't think people want to die of pneumonia before their time. There are a number of strategies to keep the lungs healthy um, in respiratory muscle weakness. At the center, it is a family of devices, airway clearance devices. And I'm just going to talk uh, primarily about one type of airway clearance device, a cough assist machines. I've shown here a stalwart, the Philips Respironics T70 cough assist device. Here's a new one, Hill Rom Company Volterra system has some nice advantages. The Voxen ventilator has cough assist built in. Now these are very versatile machines that can set, be set every which way and they serve more than one purpose, but um, for airway clearance, what they do is give a breath in, a big, big breath to fill your lungs completely. And then they suck it all out again. The size, the duration of the inhalation, the pause at the end of the inhalation, how forceful, how long the expiration, it's all fine tuned adjustable to fit a person. I really recommend getting into this early on before you need it because there's a fair amount of learning to be done. I mean, you plug it in, you push the button, but syncing with a cough assist device takes some time and experience and there might be value in getting deep breaths, deep sighing breaths once or twice a day. So invest in this early, uh, get it set just right, make it your friend, the cough assist device is working properly. If lo and behold, there's a little sense of congestion down in your chest and it brings it right up to the back of your throat where you can swallow it or spit it out or someone else can suction it out for you. There are other devices that are applied to replace a weak cough for airway clearance. Uh, but this is the must have must have in, in possession, must know how to use it well before you need it. Look, everything's fine. And then Saturday night, you get a viral infection with chest congestion and shortness of breath. And where's that machine? How do I turn it on? How, what, what am I supposed to do with this thing? Well, to get through that infection at home, you might be using this four, six, seven times a day. Look, it's replacing your cough 10 times a day. So forget about it. If you haven't prepared yourself, if you're not using it regularly in anticipation, so you can just plug it in and same thing as you did yesterday, but now this time four, six, eight times on today. Here's a big step forward. This is the big, big leap forward in home assisted ventilation of just the past oh, three or four years. We were the first in the country to use ventilator home telemetry uh, of the Respironics company. That was 2017. Yeah. So the big new thing is devices to quantitatively monitor the function of home ventilators. Turn on the lights and see what you're doing. Our program centers around monitoring devices for home ventilation. And I'm embarrassed to say way, way too few ALS patients have access to this technology through their home care companies, through their clinicians. It's not something you, you learn in fellowship or you can learn overnight. Uh, this is a big art. It's the cornerstone of our program. What am I talking about? Well, here's an astral ventilator on stand. 
because we insisted on it, we track every one of our patients. The home DME company has brought a uh, cellular modem. The machine continuously downloads device function to the cellular modem, which transmits by telephone to a company supported central server one to three times a day and updating the data. Once I'm registered to take care of you, username, password, and I can see a wealth of information about how you, I'm spying on you, I'm sorry, but I'm in your bedroom and I'm watching your breathing. I hope that's okay. Uh, a wealth of, of um, data presented in different ways. This is midnight to 11 a.m. recording of various functions of the machine minute by minute overnight. I know how much you're doing it and I know what the machine is doing and I know how your body is responding. This information allows us to go back and fine tune and reset and readjust the machine in pursuit of those four goals that I told you about. This is the other critical tool for our practice. Not many people have this. But look, this is available to everybody, but very few clinicians do it. Home DME companies are not financially motivated to do this. You gotta have a system. Here's the other device. Maybe half a dozen cities in the country, you, you, you get access to this. I don't know, maybe 10, 12, I don't know. This is a blood gas monitoring device, a non-invasive blood gas monitoring device. And this program devoted to respiratory failure, we haven't done an outpatient blood gas in two years. We haven't stuck anybody's wrist in two years because we have these in, two of these in our office and uh, we use this to measure carbon dioxide, oxygen saturation with a high degree of accuracy and heart rate. This is the sensor that attaches to the skin. Here's a patient in our office. We're fine tuning the settings on this astral ventilator. We're watching him, we're asking how he feels, he's comfortable, what's not. We're seeing a wealth of data on the screen of the device. And while we're working, we're watching his carbon dioxide, his oxygen and his heart rate. You can maybe see this, uh, CO2 is 41, right? Normal. We finished our titration. It's working well for him here in the day. We're going to have to check him out at nighttime because night is very different for day. Every patient, every visit into our office, we're doing this measurement. And that's not all. The DME companies we work with have purchased these so we can ask them to record Blood gas is non-invasively overnight in the home. Now that's what really counts, right? Not awake sitting in the office. It's what's actually happening to you the most vulnerable time in the day at nighttime. This is our founder's uh, recording. This is Jay Fishman. <laughs> he taught me this. I mean, I, I told him how to get it. He got to it or whatever, but he taught me about this. So. This is an overnight recording of his carbon dioxide. Just a few years ago, you needed to stick a needle in, in a wrist, and put the syringe in ice and rush it off to a lab. Now I'm recording overnight at home, carbon dioxide, oxygen saturation, heart rate. These are histograms that show the distribution of the results overnight. Well, this is a normal, normal recording. Jay was right on top of his ventilation. He leaned in, normal, normal, normal. Not everybody's normal. You're looking for a practice that offers monitoring, at least ventilator monitoring by home telemetry. And if at all possible, at least 
in office measurements of carbon dioxide. But look, you're not always going to get all of this. And here's some things you can do for yourself to check your ventilator function yourself at home or the person who's caring for you is going to be there looking in on you at nighttime. And here's kind of a, a guideline to what you might check on a ventilator. I'm showing you here for a trilogy, but the other machines have large screens like this. Same for the other machines. First, be very, very aware of what's happening with the battery. These are wonderful machines that you can unplug them and put them on the back of a wheelchair and cruise around and carry them around the house. And the battery backs up in case there's a power, out, a power outage, but it's possible to make some terrible mistakes if you're not self-aware. The mistake is you think you're running on, on wall power at nighttime, you're actually running on the battery. The battery dies in the middle of the night the machine starts carrying on all every which way, stops functioning. It's the middle of the night, you're waking up, the family's up, you don't quite know what's going on. Off to the emergency room, it's because the machine was running on the battery that night, not plugged in. So the bottom of the screen is information on batteries. This is the internal battery an attachable battery it has two batteries inside. You can attach a third one. It tells you whether they're charged and it tells you whether it's running off the wall or off a battery. So awareness of batteries. It's probably the most common problem in home ventilation. I'm sorry, but don't expect your neurologist to zone in on this or even the home respiratory therapist necessarily. Great if you can climb on top of a circuit leak. The ventilators we use today have a built-in leak in the mask. So you put your hand up, you'll feel the little air coming out. That's right and proper. What I'm talking about here is unintended leaks around the edges of a mask or out of an open mouth. Maybe not at daytime, maybe when you're sleeping at nighttime. The ventilator screen continuously reports the leak. Now the machine has a built-in leak of 24 in these trilogies. So shown here, a leak of 30 liters per minute, just a little bit more than the built-in leak. That's fine. That's a good, nice seal. That's working well. For a trilogy anyway, a leak less than 40 liters per minute is good. 40 to 60 liters per minute, there's a leak somewhere. And maybe it's 50, 60 when you're looking, the machine can compensate for that. And maybe when you turn your back, it's higher. Above 60, more or less, the machine um, doesn't any longer report accurate results for some of the other numbers. The machines are pretty good at making up for bigger leaks, but if you're seeing a, a leak above 60 and you're hearing a, a noise and you feel a leak around the mask or someplace, well, that's broken. This is your life. So get rid of the leaks. And, and, and maybe you can figure out by readjusting the, resetting the mask a little bit or buying another one or need help from the DME company or your clinician. Check the leak. It's this box right here. So I have an unacceptable leak. Uh, most of the time that involves changing to a different mask. People open their jaws at night. And if they're open their jaws, the air that goes in the nose can come right out the mouth. So one of these masks, it may be appropriate to switch to a mask that covers the mouth and the nose. And you think, look, if this fits well and it's nice and tight, that's the end of it. No. Um, this woman at nighttime slacks her jaw, opens her mouth, and as the jaw opens, it retracts and creates a leak around the jaw that can be substantial. 
can render the whole thing entirely useless even under a full face mask. So now getting in some expertise, some real finesse and skill in how to get rid of that leak, a different mask, a, a different fit, different size. And here's a tool that isn't used often enough. Oh, you know, oh my God, what are you talking to me? I'm going to do this. But uh, this is, these are chin straps. <clears throat> now, well, put this on underneath a, a nose or a face mask, and it just gently holds the jaw up so it doesn't open at nighttime. That's all it does. Dozens of these available on Amazon. Recently, we've had some very good luck with this one. I'm really going to wear that. Well, who's seeing you at nighttime? Come on. Uh, yes, if you want to have a fuck, a, a, a effective functional um, ventilation at nighttime, yes. This product is called PAP Cap Chin Strap. You can get it from their website for $35. Amazon ones are often $15, $19, $20. This one's a little secure, but some others, they just shift up onto the jaw or around the side and they, they slide off in the middle of the night. So. Fix your leak. Next thing on this self-check routine, take a look at the tidal line. That's the size of a breath. Uh, too small has several problems. Way too large might be uncomfortable and uh, might increase the size of a leak. So we use, we use uh, tables and graphs and to uh, figure out what the tidal volume breath size should be according to height. And a lot of what we do is just set the machine and we're hitting our target tidal volume Roughly, roughly for an ordinary sized adult, it's 500 mLs. Smaller person, five feet tall, maybe it's 440 mLs. Six feet tall, 620 mLs. So there's a reasonable range. You're not terribly off if you're at 500. But look, your tidal volumes are 250, 300. That's not optimal on their problems. This number can bounce around in the daytime while you're getting used to the machine because it re represents the pressure on your back, those two hands, plus your own effort. The machine pressure is stable, but you're varying your effort with each breath. So it bounces around, it can be kind of frustrating, but uh, you can settle things down and get a, a stable recording. Look at that number, 500 plus or minus, 250, 300, 180, not big enough. At nighttime in particular, with a poorly set machine, the breath rate can go down, 8, 10, 12, 8, 10 breaths per minute. For many people, that's not adequate. Um, for many people, a sweet zone is 16 to 24, 25 breaths per minute. It's possible eight or 10 is okay, but often it's not. Uh, 30, 34 breaths per minute is too fast, something's wrong. Now take the size of each breath and multiply it by the number of breaths per minute, and you get the next thing on this checklist which is the minute ventilation right here. The in, minute ventilation is how much air goes in and out of your lungs per minute with some corrections. The more minute ventilation, the lower the carbon dioxide, less minute ventilation, the higher. Ideally, you're measuring carbon dioxide at nighttime mostly not available. So this is kind of a rough and dirty guide substitute to thinking about whether your carbon dioxide is probably okay. 
Very, very roughly uh, 7.2 liters per minute. Puts you in a normal CO2 for a smaller person, 110 pounds. 10 liters per minute for a larger person. Uh, what's right for you may vary from these numbers and that's where we come in. We, we're compulsing and finessing this all over the place to get this right, to get carbon dioxide right. But look, if you're at 4.5 or 3.4 liters per minute, yeah, you're not at nighttime for a couple hours at nighttime, your carbon dioxide is high enough that you're going to feel it during the day. And you're that much closer to the grave. So num good number to how would that happen? Well, here's one common way. A home respiratory therapist sets the machine early in the disease, leaning in, early start, great. Lower settings, comfort settings, it's okay for a little boost at nighttime. But now ALS has progressed. Muscles are much weaker. Remaining respiratory muscle strength plus a little boost from a machine is inadequate anymore. Small tidal volumes, you can't get your respiratory rate up to compensate and the minute ventilation goes down. Two weeks ago, I, I saw by telemedicine a person from Boston, 14 months into ventilation, set it and forget it settings. With the minute ventilation at night of 3.7, I calculated as a pretty nasty carbon dioxide. No wonder he said his machine wasn't working anymore and, and he wanted a tracheostomy. So minute ventilation is kind of a, a loose marker for carbon dioxide, very rough guidelines. It's right on the front of the machine. It'll bounce around while you're awake and you're all freaked out about it and taking different size breaths. But looking at that at nighttime is a very good measure. Right, one last thing on my list, be aware and understand alarms. A lot of people think their machine is just supposed to alarm all the time. You can make the person up and make the family up. It's like a hospital, there's no peace or quiet in an ICU. So I guess we're not supposed to have any peace or quiet at all. So the darn thing goes off and you press this um, little alarm release button up here and fiddle around and try to get back to sleep. Um, some of this is an old fashioned way of monitoring a ventilator. New fashioned way is to upload from the machine to the cloud and then username, password, the information and look directly at all these numbers that have alarms on them. So maybe some alarms in the beginning, but um, Poor man's approach, rich man's approach is look at the data directly online. Most of our patients go forward with ALS with just one uh, alarm operative, the circuit disconnect. Look, if the thing comes dislodged, if it's pushed half to the side of a face, uh, it's not functioning at all, that's an alarm. That's wake somebody up and don't fix it. So. We always keep a circuit disconnect alarm on at 20 seconds of no ventilation. But the other stuff, it's just a nuisance and annoyance. And I can see the alarms ringing. When I look online, I can see 22 alarms last night. The people aren't even complaining about it. They think it's just supposed to keep them up all night. All right. So there you go. That's a checklist for a ventilator. Battery circuit leak over here, the size of the breaths, the respiratory rate, whoops. Be sure you know what the battery's doing. Get the alarms proper that they're, they're not in your way. I wanna say a few things about tracheostomy. I'm gonna break with convention here. Because what so many people are told about tracheostomies is so out of date. Oh, man. Very many times, early on in ALS, there's a lot of emphasis. You start thinking you need to decide whether you're going to have a tracheostomy or not. A lot of discussion about that, a lot of asking early on in the disease. 
people think of a tracheostomy as a life extender. This is a pathway for better or for worse into far advanced muscle weakness, quadriplegia, maybe all the way to a locked in state. So people think of it as a life extender. Maybe they want that, maybe they don't. I, I don't think about tracheostomy that way at all. Look, this is just ordinary everyday care in an intensive care unit for pulmonary and critical care docs. I see a tracheostomy as a specialty tool to come off the shelf to solve several specific problems. If those problems don't arise, many people can go the entire duration all the way non-invasively without needing to be forced into a tracheostomy or die question. So these are the three reasons that a tracheostomy might be appropriate in ALS. Now the first is upper airway dysfunction. I call it failure here. Bulbar onset disease, prominent weakness in the throat, or even worse, upper motor neuron bulbar disease with a tendency of these muscles to spasm. A positive pressure breath from a machine or positive pressure from a cough assist device spasms the throat shut. So the mass ventilation is, can be very hard to achieve for people with bulbar onset, bulbar prominent disease, especially if there's spasticity. And we think we can help a lot of people through that by starting very early with little tiny pressure support, slow and low, inching them way into it. But uh, not everybody with bulbar prominent ALS uh, tolerates mechanical ventilation. So a failure of the upper airway earlier on in the disease you still have function and you still have life, an earlier tracheostomy might be very appropriate, completely bypassing the larynx where this spasm and these problems are occurring. A second special situation for tracheostomy is very uncomfortably or threatening retention of lung secretions. I told you there's a whole family of Airway clearance devices designed to clear that stuff out. And early, early use of them, becoming an expert on them, playing around and getting it right, solves retained secretions for a lot of people. We have underlying chronic bronchitis, underlying lung disease, bronchiectasis, um, I don't know, whatever. And secretions are really accumulating. They're uncomfortable, they block off airways drop oxygen level. The tracheostomy allows insertion of a catheter into the main trachea. The catheter is attached to a suction device. That's another way of replacing a failed cough. So second indication for tracheostomy is uncomfortably or threateningly routine secretions. And the third reason is some people just really don't want a mask on their face. They want their mouth back. Oh, and maybe they had a scary episode where the mask came off and they just rescued. Um, so a tracheostomy frees up a person's face. And this is a very secure connection to a ventilator. So people who uh, uh, get really upset about masks, the hell with it, might take a tracheostomy for comfort and for security. It's possible, increasingly common to go the distance without a trach. And decisions about extending life and care into advanced ALS can and should be made independently of this little piece of technology as I'm gonna talk about in a minute. So disassociate um, progression of disease from trachs. Putting in a trach doesn't compel anybody 
to carry forward to a locked in state. I think the focus instead of on tracheostomies, wait till the question comes up for trachs. It's an honest um, assessment, patient, closest caregivers about how this is going to end. And, and this is what I try to promise my patients. We want to help you live as well as you can for as long as you look forward to another day. If the burden becomes too great, we can help you fall asleep with the expectation that you're not reawaken. Some births are planned. Today it's possible to plan a death. And many people don't want to think about it. It's terrifying. It's so overwhelming. But for some people, the alternative is just kind of lying there, waiting for a fatal event, the pneumonia you're not rescued from. It's lying there waiting for a fatal event. So it's possible to head all of that off by thinking and planning for how a person is going to die. That should be conversation, patient, and those caregivers who are at home. There's kind of three approaches to gaining control toward the end of life, and I've listed them here. The names may change, local communities might use a little bit different terminology, but this is the basic idea. The first level, palliative sedation and analgesia. You're pretty uncomfortable. You're anxious, you're frightened. Look, the ventilator's working. You're not very far away from suffocation. It's terrifying. What's going to come forward? Very uncomfortable. People have pain as well as shortness of breath. So some, some, some medicines are commonly used to take the edge off of the experience of ALS in advanced stages. Lorazepam is Ativan. Morphine is an opioid. Cannabis is coming on strong. Not inhale, no smoke it with ALS. Now, tools that are available to take the edge off. They're appropriate for some, for many people. Each of them has side effects. You got to know the side effects because that tells you when you push too hard. Opioids particularly, particularly, particularly cause constipation. You've got to be ahead of constipation if you get into opioids. The other thing about these medicines is, well, it can take an edge off of anxiety, maybe even a little edge off of not comfortable breathing, but they can also bring about an in-between place where you're conscious but confused, disoriented, delirious an acute psychotic state, much more common than is appreciated by people around, unless you really get out of it wild about it. Uh, so uh, this isn't necessarily the right for the duration, half in, half out, waiting for something to happen. The second one I've listed is the usual, ordinary, day in and day out, way out, for people with uh, respiratory failure, not expected to get better in ICUs. In our ICU, about 70% of everybody who dies uh, for 24 beds, 25, 26 deaths a month, 70% of them by the second approach. Enough medicine to take the misery away, fall asleep, under that sedation, Life-supporting therapy is withdrawn. Care continues, attentive focal care continues as long as a person needs it without the life support machine, the ventilator, that's no longer serving a useful purpose. Routine ordinary care in ICUs. Well, it's many places it's not really available. Outpatients, hospices, 
to often back off on this. They don't like to do it for many reasons. They may or may not offer it in their inpatient unit. I, I, you know, I don't like any of this, but considering the alternative, if somebody says, that's it, I've had enough, I'm ready to fall asleep, please make me comfortable, please, please keep me dignified. And they're continuously dependent on a ventilator, whether non-invasive or invasive, doesn't matter one hoot. Falling asleep, taking the machine away, continuing care without the machine is an alternative that uh, pulmonologists can bring into the care of ALS based on our experience in ICUs. Well, the third one is legally available in only several states in the, in the country. And it's an option for those who um, are not dependent on life support. So for whatever reason, point of no return before dependency on life support, falling asleep and taking off a ventilator, you're only using eight hours a day. It's just plain falling asleep. So this one is for people who are not dependent on life support. Very, very underdeveloped for home care in the United States. You're very fortunate if you're in an environment where you can get good backup and support for this all the way through. All right, I've talked pulmonary medicine for a few minutes now. And I propose that this model is out of date. Extraordinary advances in tools for respiratory care have left us behind. I propose a new paradigm for treatment of ALS. A neurology led team and a pulmonary led team. We can't squeeze them all into the same room, you know, same place. One stop shopping is not really the way modern medicine is practiced anymore. We support our practice with eight cabinets full of tools and equipment and supplies. Can't carry that over to the neurologist, although we do cross cover sometimes. So by this approach, the neurology practice has, has purview, a very, very busy diagnosis, disease modifying medications, working with uh, occupational physical therapists, speech therapists, and mobility and communication assistive technologies. The new specialty is neuropsychiatry, uh, addressing people's mental health care. The pulmonologists are internists. Early on in the course of the disease, shortly after um, diagnosis, pulmonologist assesses other conditions heart, lung disease, kidney disease, sleep disease, that have bearing on a person's experience of ALS. While a person is still highly functional, ambulatory helps that individual to get everything shored up. Looks to medical comorbidities, a course to respiration broadly defined. And we're very, very accustomed to tube feeding in ICUs. It's bread and butter. <clears throat> tube feeding is often appropriate when someone starts to aspirate as one of the strategies for protecting the lungs. So we're very comfortable you know, timing and figuring out how to safely put it to. We don't do it ourselves, but we can overlook that. So look, in a specific community, maybe the, the adjustment is a little bit different. And, and I think uh, in common, both practices should share commitment and responsibility for palliative and end-of-life care. Neurologists have been doing that all along, but pulmonologists coming in before you here, look, we do that. If anybody knows about death, it's ICU doctors, have a lot to bring in and contribute. People die of respiratory failure, respiratory failure, core of our specialty. So palliative and end-of-life care can be a joint effort of both types of practices. So is this achievable? Uh, this is a tall order. I, 
not here to tell you all the reasons why, but it's achievable. We're doing it at Penn now. Here's the neurology practice, multidisciplinary, and the pulmonary practice. Constant communication back and forth, rough understanding about what the neurologists do and what we do and what we share alike, pretty very much in this book. It can be done. This is well-developed, this is nascent. Not everybody's gonna have the Fishmans to start up a home pulmonary program, but uh, there's something that this group, people on this phone call might be able to help us with. So here's a little plea for a little bit of help. In the United States today, you can find a list <clears throat> of accredited neurology-based ALS centers on the ALS Association website and on the Muscular Dystrophy Association website. There is no such listing for pulmonary medicine or for sleep therapy or for um, occupational physical therapy. Uh, we could very much benefit from a group of three to five people who come together, working within everything ALS or carrying ALS or both. Uh, you guys know your organization to create a listing of qualified, committed, educated pulmonary physicians and practices that welcome referrals of ALS patients. Carrying ALS has actually started it though. There's, there's, one, there's one practice list of there. Uh, so what this would take, what this would take is a small group that steps forward to bring this off. And if that group happens, I can, I can provide mailing lists that can help you get started. This group would decide the formatting and uh, figure out the qualifications, very, very loose in the beginning, maybe tighter and tighter as time goes on. Uh, and very, very importantly, update the list at six to 12 month intervals. So it's current. So this would be an ongoing project. And then the last part of this is to use all the Hindu Navarre, all the everything ALS power to bring uh, prominence to this in web searches. So that when people are looking for pulmonologists that come right to this listing. Uh, so it's gotta be up, up front and center. That's a fundamental break away from ALS Association. They will not do this. I've tried, Muscular Dystrophy Association won't. They're very tightly attached to the idea of a single unified multidisciplinary clinic. Pulmonologists don't attach well to neurologists. Uh, the money that comes into an ALS clinic stays with the neurologist, doesn't go any, not a nickel to pulmonary medicine. Time for a new paradigm. A nice interesting step forward is to make a list of pulmonologists who are committed to this, helping people find a way, helping us find one another. We don't even know who we are. All right, that's something I'm asking for today. Thank you, John. I Bring think it that's everything, good. folks. And uh, breathing is everything. And uh, I hope I have reminded you of that today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if you brought up, um, yes, we want to do that. And we want to bring in, uh, you know, the pulmonology. Uh, uh, when Randy brought this up, I did not understand completely. And um, the more conversations we had, absolutely. I think, like you mentioned, you know, ALS is also the disease of pulmonology and we need to care uh, adequately very early on. And, um, and what you have done to some of our friends whom I've introduced, it's been amazing. They've had, they, they, you know, they've had a really life-changing experience um, and through this ALS journey, just working with you and understanding all the pulmonology needs that they had no idea about. So thank you for that and um, look forward to making this program successful working with you. And I will turn this uh, uh, mic over to Sarah and Tara, who will ask you questions. I know it's been 
long presentation. You covered a lot of material and we're so appreciative for it. But, you know, if, uh, um, if at any time, you know, you think that it's, uh, you know, you can't answer any more questions, it's fine. We can send you the questions and we can get it answered later. Thank you, John. And thank you, Randy. You said, my name is Sarah. Um, I'm a part of the Care Everything ALS team. I'm also a med student um, as well as a nurse. So uh, I'm from the ICU as well. So some of this has kind of um, been my background, but the reason I am in ALS is I lost my dad in 2018. So what you talked about today was a lot of information that was so important. And I really truly wish that we had had it um, back then as well. Uh, we'll get started with our first question. And I think you kind of touched on this a little bit, but at the early stages of ALS in the beginning of diagnostics, um, do you believe all patients should go directly to a pulmonologist as well as their neurologist? Yes. And how often should patients see their pulmonologist? This is not commonly practiced, but in the ideal, um, a diagnosis is established, initial questions are answered, and then a referral to a pulmonologist. The sooner the better. In that first visit, we're looking for other diseases that are relevant, help you to the hearing who you are and, and what your needs are, putting forward this idea of leaning in and starting the testing process. Uh, it remains to be proven, but I think that early start participatory care for all across ALS, but particularly pulmonary medicine is good. So uh, I, in the ideal, people come to a pulmonologist early on, and now going forward, there's a neurology practice and an internal medicine pulmonary practice side by side, addressing needs and helping to coordinate the risk. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, our next question is, what are exercises patients can do to help strengthen their respiratory system? Yeah. Well, it's a controversial question and um, the NIH is gonna pay us $1.2 million over the next five years to address a piece of that. <laughs> so something we're, we're interested in. Um, it's not clear that you can strengthen respiratory muscles by exercising when we use them all the time. But, but what we're testing is a question of whether really deep breaths come under several names, um, breath stacking, I like to call it assisted sighing. But the re really deep breaths once, twice, three times a day might be helpful. Uh, now that's not exercising the muscles that are weakened by lack of innervation, but it's, stretching the chest wall and re-expand and collapse parts of the lungs. It's a little bit like passive range of motion for somebody who's lost strength in an arm. So the cough assist machine can be adjusted so that it gives only a deep inhalation and not that forceful exhalation. Less uncomfortable, like passive range of motion for a leg or an arm. Unproven, I think it might be helpful and we're out to test it. Uh, I'm not I'm not an advocate for other um, types of um, breathing strengthening muscles beyond walking and, and uh, being physically active in general. Thank you. You spoke during your presentation about getting these different tools early in order to um, establish how to use them as well as practicing with them beforehand. How are patients able to either get a prescription or get some of these tools before yeah. they're actually needed? Oh, yeah. It's so important to have, a, have clinicians, whether pulmonologists or not, who are tuned to the pulmonary side and will work with you. Um, they're going to have to meet Medicare requirements to get insurance coverage. And so monitoring your own vital capacity is a way of, you know, I'm getting pretty close in the 65 uh, Probably they'll have to verify the number in the office to do it, but um, having a practice that's attuned to um, and a little bit clever and creative about persuading the insurance companies is very helpful. I told you about companies that sell masks. Well, they also sell ventilators. There's another one called, um, um, I'll think about it, self-gently used machines. 
So you're really aggressive about this. You can actually buy your own bi-level device to get a head start. You got to be very technically sophisticated because you're not going to have a home respiratory therapist to set it up. But maybe if you buy the office-based respiratory, so it is possible to jump the gun by buying your own machine and get some help setting up. And another strategy is sleep overnight sleep testing, polysomnography. Some people qualify early on by an overnight sleep study and they can jump ahead of the Medicare rules. So early, early is at least detecting when you reach Medicare rules for very tech savvy people, maybe buying or leasing a machine in advance and giving it away to a machine bank afterwards when insurance covers for you. And then uh, I'm kind of, I think fine to do sleep studies early on in pursuit of a indication for a prescription. Thank you. Um, can you share what's recommended for a severe bulbar nerve weak weakness making lip seal poor? Yeah. Um, there's, a, there's a kind of mouthpiece um, that I didn't show you. It's not commonly used, but um, it has an inner lip. So there's an outer lip and an inner lip, and the, the, the jaw and the teeth close down around the inner lip. So naturally, most of the time, people's mouths are kind of shut, and it just holds it in place. So there is a special kind of mouthpiece that holds in place for people who have very weak jaws. Uh, uh, the mask that I've shown you uh, can be used in a way that doesn't require any uh, jaw strength. And, uh, and I like starting early with bulbar disease with very low pressures and very slow inhalations, very, very gentle. Back in that early phase when all people need is a little bit of a boost and uh, inching the machine up and into place um, rather than trying to lay it on when you really need it, you can't lie flat and launching full-fledged into full uh, settings right away. That's welcoming spasm and other problems. So all part disease is the biggest challenge of assisted ventilation, but there are some tricks. There is a type of mouthpiece that can be used if somebody can't hold others in the mouth. Thank you. And again, tracheostomy, so to set a trade-off, so some people come out ahead with an earlier tracheostomy. Can you explain the difference between BiPAP and CPAP and why one may be used in ALS over the other? These are wonderful questions. I'm so grateful to be here and uh, that people are engaged. Everyone is a good question. CPAP is a single pressure dialed in. 5, 10, 15 centimeters of water pressure. It achieves that with a constant flow of air up the tubing and into the mask with a fixed leak. The machine is continuously adjusting the flow rate to maintain that one pressure. The pressure stents open the upper airway. It moves the, jaw, the tongue forward so it doesn't collapse against the back of CPAP is for sleep apnea. Bilevel ventilation is two pressures. There's a low expiratory pressure, same as CPAP, and on top of that is an inspiratory pressure, that boost I was talking about. So the inspiratory pressure might be 15, the expiratory pressure five, the difference in is pressure support. That's the boost you get with each inhalation. And that's for people who have weak breathing muscles at nighttime. Thank you. At uh, what forced vital capacity is BiPAP treatment imperative? Um, we don't have a perfect scientific answer to that question, but at a forced vital capacity, I'll take the forced off. At a vital capacity of 50% predicted, 
you've lost 80, 90% of your diaphragm function. And you're starting to use accessory muscles or fatigue. So um, my best answer to your question is a 50% predicted. Get hoppy and get, get started. Can you explain what proning is and has proning patients with ALS showed any ineffective treatment? Just a question. Uh, in ICUs, acute respiratory failure, COVID, uh, influenza, uh, people traditionally went flat on their backs. Now we know an advantage of elevating the head of the head 30 degrees. And when people are having a terrible time getting enough oxygen, into their blood because their lungs are very sick. Their breathing muscles may be normal, but this is COVID, their lungs are sick. Well, it turns out that rolling somebody on their stomach can considerably improve oxygenation. COVID respiratory failure is about low blood oxygen. COPD is, I mean, <laughs> ALS is about high CO2. So proning is a life-saving therapy for acute respiratory failure in ICUs. It doesn't really play a role in ALS. Look, if you're more comfortable lying on your stomach and you can get a mask that doesn't dislodge when you lie to your stomach, head to the side, it's fine, but it won't help you. Thank you. Since many ALS patients present to the hospital with pneumonia, is antibiotic prophylaxis recommended for ALS? Why or why not? Yeah. Really good assisted ventilation. Non-invasive mass ventilation, you got your act together. Well, that machine will keep you going for the duration as long as your lungs are, are, are healthy and your airways are clear. For the duration, right to the post, locked in state. So the, the threat with good assisted ventilation is aspiration, food swallowed going down the wrong pipe, stomach contacts coming in, retained secretions that aren't cleared, uh, bacterial pneumonias, and half the attention in respiratory ALS seems to be attended to that. Uh, before I did ALS, I did a lot of bronchiectasis, which is chronic lung infections. So I, I know inside and out lung infections and, um, and I feel qualified to answer your question. Uh, I do think that everyday antibiotics are appropriate for some patients who go into ALS with everyday sputum production, chronic bronchitis, bronchiectasis, with a chronic airway infection or frequent exacerbations, three, four, five infections of the this is part of this idea of early pulmonary involvement. What are the comorbidities? You have chronic lung infection. There are certain situations where I give an antibiotic and you get azithromycin is a common a use one for a variety of reasons. Beyond that, what I do in ALS is um, we, we give people uh, an antibiotic for their shell and talk about how to be suspicious of a lung infection. And we write out a whole sick plan, one copy in the chart, other we hand to the patient. And it's a checklist of things to do if you get an infection, which includes starting yourself an antibiotic. For people who kind of a tendency of bacterial infections, we'll also ask them to send off a sputum culture so that if the bacteria is a nasty one, we can figure that out day two or three and change to a different antibiotic. So short answer to your question, some situations, I think daily preventive antibiotics make sense. And in any case, people should have a little kit and a preformed plan of how to deal with the chest infection when it comes up in ALS, up to a certain point, better and safer to manage that at home than in the hospital. We can, we look, you're on life support. We, we can do IV antibiotics at home. We do it day in and day out for cystic fibrosis and bronchiectasis. So um, infection, fortunately, doesn't 
there's a lot of people all the way along in ALS compared to some other diseases, but it's another area where ALS um, care can be radically improved by simply importing what we know from other situations in ALS. Wonderful. Um, you spoke a little earlier about how ALS is a CO2 or carbon dioxide retention disorder. So what are your thoughts on supplemental oxygen for patients with ALS? Wonderful questions, one after another after another. Uh, as carbon dioxide rises, oxygen falls. It's one of the reasons that oxygen goes down in ALS. You're 97, 98, and now all of a sudden you're 92, 91. Well, that could be a problem with airways or lungs, but it could be a problem with hypoventilation. That can be a clue to hypoventilation. So uh, uh, what often happens is people don't figure out the hypoventilation part and they give supplemental oxygen without knowing what the carbon dioxide is. It's not solving the problem. Oxygen does nothing for hypoventilation, for a high CO2 on account of not breathing enough. So it's, it's a wrong solution to the problem. It's covering up, obscuring the problem, which is you need assisted ventilation. So it is a mistake to give supplemental oxygen in ALS, unless you know what the carbon dioxide is, or at least what the minute ventilation is, and you have some reason to think that there's retained secretions or infection, that like this is some problem that causes hypoxemia. So two separate sides of a coin, very many times people mess up by missing the hypoventilation because it's hard to measure carbon dioxide, easy to measure oxygen and, and, and giving oxygen when it's not the right answer. Thank you so much. Can you explain in basic terms what it means by the partial pressure of carbon dioxide increasing and how this is related to respiratory muscle weakness? Yeah. See, so respiratory pump, diaphragm, chest cage, accessory muscles, that's a vital organ. The job of respiratory pump is to move just the right amount of air in and out of the lungs per minute. The muscles weaken and fatigue, the respiratory pump can't keep up anymore. Breathing gets shallow, smaller breaths. The minute ventilation goes down, not enough air circulating through the lungs to get rid of carbon dioxide. So the carbon dioxide goes up. Normal is 35 to 45. So it goes to 45, 50, 60. It's 48 in the daytime and it's 65, 70 at nighttime. Well, starting at a carbon dioxide of 70 or 80, it's a poison. It'll put you to sleep. Very variable, one person to another, 90, 100. 100, 500, 10. You're breathing four times a minute. Uh, Maybe you make it to the hospital, maybe not. So a rising carbon dioxide means not enough air per minute in and out of the lungs, meaning that the vital organ, the chest pump, can't keep up with needs and is failing. So our last question of the night, because it has been, um a night full of information. This is definitely one I will for sure watch again. Uh, in exercise-induced asthma attacks, as we know, patients can use prophylactic albuterol to help open their lungs a little bit. Is there any reason to believe that that, that strategy would work in ALS? There's a family of tools that are used for airways in ALS. A nebulizer with albuterol is one of them. It reverses too much muscle function, spasm or contraction, smooth muscle that's wrapped around the airways, narrowing the airways. 
I guess it can happen sometimes in ALS. You're coming into it with COPD or bronchitis or asthma. You can have asthma, a comorbidity to know about. So I look at uh, albuterol as a special tool in ALS for people who brought into the disease some condition that predisposes them to bronchospasm, spasming of those muscles, most particularly asthma. So asthma are asthma like COPD, you carry forward that treatment into, into ALS. Some people do it before they do cough assist. Some people skip the albuterol and inhale uh, a saltwater mist before cough assist. So deliver some extra moisture to the airways, dilute the secretions, maybe that makes it easier to carry it out with a cough assist device. Well, on that note, I want to thank you uh, and Randy for coming tonight and speaking with us. This has been lots of information as well as very useful information that I don't think many people have access to all the time. So that's um, wonderful that you were able to spend this amount of time with, with us and um, we will definitely be utilizing this in the future. So um, go ahead. Sorry. I didn't uh, step forward and give me a list of uh, a pulmonologists on a prominent website. Now we're in partnership. All right, we'll work on it. I'm, I'm all for it. I just wanted to end. I wanted to just say one thing at the end. First of all, of course, I always want to thank John because he has so much information and he's um, additionally just such a wonderful caregiver and human being in the way he delivers his care. And I think that really came across this evening. Um, but just really from a personal experience, again, because this is what drove me and my husband to have this collaboration and to really um, delve into this and to really push to make a change in the treatment of ALS. And again, just uh, from a purely personal um, experience. Um, so Jay, as I said, you know, had a very axial form of the disease and had limb function for, for quite a long time, almost until he passed away. And at one point, before we had the Centec and had the evening monitoring, he just was feeling exhausted. And he really thought, oh, the disease is progressing, you know, and I'm getting weaker. And that's why my endurance isn't as good. And I'm fatiguing so much earlier in the day, et cetera. And all of the markers we might all come to understand. And shortly thereafter, um, you know, we did the whole monitoring. We did, and just from very simple adjustment of the oxygen and carbon dioxide levels from his, um, we had a Centec at home. It was, I, I mean, I sound like a salesperson for this machine and I'm not, and I too have no financial interest in anything except that I just want everybody to get better. Um, it really made a big difference for him and he really experienced such better energy and endurance. And the quality of his life was, I will say dramatically, and I don't, I don't use that word lightly changed. And so I really urge everyone to, Jay used that term and John used it and really to lean in. And I, I urge all of you to take the cough assist seriously, take it early, keep your lungs clear. I mean, it's not something that uh, is really talked about a lot. People don't discuss it, but even if you don't have an infection, as John said, you don't know as you start to lose some of the strength in your swallowing muscles, you get tiny little microfilaments of, of ingestion of food particles into your lung that then can start to form a secretion and or a pneumonia and clearing those lungs is just paramount. And so I, I'm really in favor of it. <laughs> I know you have been very passionate about this and thank you for, um, you know, uh, getting this to my radar and our radar. And we're really so thankful for your knowledge and all the experience. Yeah, I need to get it to everybody's radar. And that's really kind of the phase of- Exactly, phase of exactly. Indu and um, everybody at a Everything ALS were really pushing towards is to, as John says, this new paradigm of treatment
that involves a pulmonologist at the very beginning, not just when you're going in, they say, and look, I know this, up, oh, your FBC is below 50. You got to start thinking about, you're going to have a trach, you know, maybe you need the feeding tube, what do you have? But no, that you, there's, you, there's things to think about well before. And you know what else? It's empowering. You're doing something. You feel like, okay, I'm somehow going to, you know, make some difference in my treatment, in my care. And I, we felt it very empowering in that way. So that we uh, are respecting everybody's time, but um, Randy and uh, John, please don't feel like you have to stay. If you want to, you can, but um, typically this is where people get to talk a little bit. McFinn runs the show. So um, thank you so much for joining and uh, we will talk again very soon. 